So I wanted us to have a conversation today so that everybody in this room and everybody that's watching can learn about what you've done in your community specifically, but also how should we think about empowering more youth activists like yourselves. So if you could each tell just a little bit about your story, about what it is exactly you do in your community and how you came to be the activist that you are today. Do you want to start, Joani? I would love to, Melanie. Thanks. So this is a story of a young girl from Benin Republic who at nine years old almost died from an asthma attack. At 12 years old, she saw her best friend dying from an abortion after an unattended pregnancy. At this moment, she realized she had the call to become a physician and address inequality in her community. This girl would not have been here if there had not been this physician saving her life. This girl, it is me. Mm. And then I decided to set up the Young Beninese Leader Association in Benin to actually advance gender equality and women's reproductive health. And we start with a little campaign, and I may elaborate on that later, that start with 300 volunteers, but throughout the country targeted 10,000 youth to talk about HIV, reproductive health, access to contraception, and women empowerment. And I'm going to add one more thing. Joani is being very humble here. She's a medical doctor who's also working on getting her PhD. <laughs> King Parker, can you share your story a little bit? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm an advocate with uh, UNICEF, mm -hmm. and um, I got a chance to go around. I mean, I, besides the performing and all that, um, we're distributing water points to, uh, to a place called Turkana Lodwa. And I got... Um, first-hand contact with a girl who was secluded in a traditional hut, and she was undergoing her menses. Mm -hmm. And um, in this day and age, they still keep girls, they sit on sand mm -hmm. or cow dung. And, and it really got to me. Uh, I said, I have this much followership and influence. How can I give back? in an impactful way. So I came back to Nairobi and I did a research. I started a campaign called the King Kaka Sanitary Bank Campaign. And as we speak, I'm six months into the campaign and I'm still learning and I'm willing to learn and that's why I'm here. But most importantly, we've benefited 10,000 girls. Um, they're in school now and we're doing a mentorship project for them. Mm -hmm. so. Fantastic. Trisha, can you explain a little bit? You know, I won't go too far back because I don't want this room to feel disconnected. A few months ago, uh, we had a case of an eight-year-old child uh, who belonged to a minority Muslim community in Kashmir who was kidnapped and gang raped over a period of days. As if that wasn't bad enough, we had local politicians take to the streets in defense of rapists with our flag because how can you jail Hindus for raping minority women? And make no mistake, this is not a problem that happens only in India. I'm going to throw a, a, a question open to the audience here. To the women in this room, Melinda and you all included, do you change your clothes based on where you go? If you're taking public transport, you feel the need to carry a scarf. If you're, taking, if you're going in your car, you say, OK, I can wear the dress I wanted to wear. Just raise your hands up if you do. OK, to the men in this room, do you change your clothes based on where you go? Today I'm taking a train, I cannot wear those shorts, lest someone touch me or pinch my ass. You know, so this is gender inequality. Don't feel disconnected that this is a problem happening in an underdeveloped country. Amongst all of us, we're constantly having to account for who's going to touch us, who's going to molest us, who's going to stare at us without our consent. And this is why I do the work that I do. I do not believe gender is a women's rights issue. I look at every issue and very shamelessly push my agenda and ask them, how is this affecting women? Mm -hmm and young people. Can, can each of you talk a little bit about, today I think everybody, you, yourselves included, and everybody in this room would call you advocates for your cause, but when did you actually make the switch to becoming an advocate? When did you start to see yourself as a leader? And was there anybody who was on your journey or your path in life that helped you know that you could become a leader? Do you want to start, Trisha? Sure. I started going on ground and working. So I worked with survivors, I worked with families, and the unfortunate reality is 
you know, even though we have laws in place, the implementation of it is so weak. To give you a story, I had a case of a child, four years old, who was raped, took her to the hospital with her father. And the hospital was refusing to administer an x-ray, even though there was a worry that her pelvis was fractured due to the force of the assault of the rape. And that's where I had to step up and say, don't you dare. I know the law, section 357C, what demands for guaranteed treatment of victims, don't you dare. And I had the father, even though he had diarrhea, show up to the courtroom and say, ma'am, I think I have diarrhea. I don't think I can show up at the courtroom. Mm -hmm. I said, it's OK. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. He still showed up. He ran to the bathroom every five minutes, and he still showed up. Mm -hmm. So if you have your ear to the ground, if you're having honest conversations with people around you, survivors are facing the worst kind of atrocities. When they show up, when their families show up, that forces you to be a leader and say, I have access to this stage. How can I support them? How can I amplify their voices? And how do I step up and be a leader to do better by them? Because we really need to. Shawani, what would you say? How did you, when did you first become a leader? And uh, was there anybody on your path that helped you with that? Absolutely. I think I'm the product of a mixture of uh, contribution and support from men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm thinking about that time when I was practicing uh, and I was still studying as a medical student and seeing some women having no information about sexual reproductive health, who are pregnant, who does not have how to know how to prevent HIV or infections or take care of their pregnancy. At this moment, I realized one thing. Health is not just about care but it is also about information and community work. This is locally. Globally, I've had the chance to be exposed with vibrant and amazing advocacy groups, such as the Women Deliver Young Leader Group, and recently, uh, as part of the United Nations Young Leader for the SDGs, and I'm learning a lot from this group, and I realize every day that the call for action never stops. They call for action to put myself out there, to learn from my mistakes, to learn from my mentors is always there. And tomorrow actually starts today. Hmm. King Kak, I want to ask you the same question, but slightly differently. So when did you know you were going to become a leader? Were you already an entertainer at that point? But then also, you could have picked any cause. And uh, you picked a cause that really re completely revolves around women and girls. You could have picked anything. How did you know you wanted to pick that cause? I know you, ha you saw this young girl, but why did you start then? Uh, I think leadership has two angles. Um, how I've learned it uh, is they're born leaders, and they're, they're leaders where we can spark the leadership in you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I became a leader when at home. Um, I'm the last born, uh, but my mom always showed me that you can be a leader. So my mom used to sell fruits. Um, uh, so when she came back home in the evening, uh, she would give me uh, a daily selling. So, and, and I would do the accounting for the house. Mm. Say, this buys the bread, this goes back to the business. And I was in primary school, uh, 11, 12 years old. So I knew from, from the word go that I'm a leader through my mom. Mm. So, and that's why even my program is very sensitive on when the ladies, when the girls are starting with their menstrual cycle. We tell them, even though this is happening, there's a lot of confidence issues, but you are leaders. The, the world can accommodate everyone as a leader. The, the more the leaders, the more the issues will, will, will face. And then two, why I decided uh, to settle on MHM, I mean, that situation was just one case. But when I came back to the city, I mean, I do gigs. Um, I make money. Uh, I, I get all these praises and I, all these likes, and I trend on social media. I mean, that, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean if I, I came to realize I'm, I'm 10 years in the game, and I realized, because I'm, I'm, you trend, and tomorrow something else is trending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and everybody forgets that. Can you take that and say, this is impactful? Mm. Can, you, can you count stories from the trend? So I said, I want to touch people's life individually. So even my program is based not only in the city, not Nairobi. So we concentrate on, on rural areas where girls know about me, but they never see me before. Mm. 
So when I, when I get there in the villages, they're really excited. Mm. So now I tell them, we have a sanitary towel here. It's a point of conversation. But I want us to talk about leadership and, and, and you being the future generation. The future is now. Mm. So let's start now. Yeah. This is your community. Be leaders, own it. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I think one of the things that as we talk about the sustainable development goals in women and girls, we need so many men to also help us, enlightened men, because we all need to teach young girls and young women uh, that they can be leaders, they can do anything. What would you all say, Joani and Tricia, what would you say um, to adults who told you along the way or tell other youth, you don't have enough experience, you're not far enough along in your life to know what you're doing? What do you say to those adults? Well, first of all, I will just smile <laughs> because I would think about millions or thousands of young <coughs> girls and boys achieving change in the community at eight years old or 10 years old. First of all, I think being a young people doesn't mean that you are unqualified. I am 28, I'm a physician, I'm working toward my PhD. I, I'm meeting younger and outstanding young people who are inspiring me, who are my mentor, mm -hmm. yeah. I have mentors who are older and younger than me. So young people are experienced, they have the innovation, they have the talent, they have the skills that is needed. And what is critical is actually not just to um, claim that we want to help young people, but actually to make sure that we are involved in every stage of the process, from designing idea, from implementing, from making sure that we are all accountable. It is a participatory process, and this is how making sure that meaningful youth engagement should be part of each of your organization principles. Meaningful youth engagement is a common and participatory process where you ensure that the voice of the advocates, of the young people, is heard, but not just as a beneficiary, but as an actor using a youth-centered approach or a women-centered approach. So definitely, there are thousands of young people who exemplify a role model and success. And I think intergenerational dialogue mm -hmm. is actually a good opportunity to learn from both ways. Adults can learn from us as young people. We will definitely learn from the experience, but it is a common exchange. So yes, young people have the skill and can bring on the table much more than just talking. Please don't put us on the floor. We want to stay on the table and we will definitely right, work together for that. Mm. Trisha, what would you add? That's great. I don't say anything to them. If you expect me to prove my worth to you, for you to take me seriously, then you're not worth it. I'll find a better ally. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what do young people need from older allies? You said, Joani, you know, obviously a seat at the table, listening to us, we've got great ideas, include us in your meetings and your activism. What else would you say, Kinkaka and Tricia, what else would you want adults to know when it does work well? How can they be most helpful to you? Um, I believe that generations have patterns, right? And uh, our patterns are different from the upper generation, even though we face the same and common problems, right? So we know how to tackle our stories. It's like when you, when you, when you sit down with a 60, 70 year old person, they'll tell you in, in our days, it was mm. different. We don't like the way you guys are doing your things now. Mm. But yet we are facing the same problems, uh, economic problems, education, still, even though now maybe patterns are, 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 are varying. So I would say we have solutions to what we have now. Mm. And you had solutions to what you had. Why don't we combine? <coughs> Why don't you combine and, and find a 2.0 version of this problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a 2.0 version. We, we can all coexist. Mm. And, and solutions will be much quicker if we partner. Mm. It's simple. It's just partner. We, we lose nothing. Mm. Yeah. What would you say, Trisha? You know, I was really deeply inspired by, and moved by what Nadia said yesterday when she said hope has an expiration date. Um, young people's bodies are bearing witness to the worst kind of abuse, violence, and atrocities. 
and their bodies are also bearing witness to people's silence and complicity. I find it unacceptable. I mean, I love the UN women and everything that they stand for, and I'm going a little rogue here, but forgive me, I find it unacceptable that a senior official got away by abusing, and I think the space warrants me to say this truth, that a senior official got away with sexually abusing young people for 15 months, that it, sorry, for a while, that the investigative process took 15 months, and that there is no accountability for the people who were complicit in covering up this. So what we need, what as young people, what we need and demand for is accountability from the older people. Do better by us. Do not look at us and say, speak up. We're speaking up, you're not listening hard enough. Do better, ask us. Look at us and ask us, and we refuse to be your token representatives. You know, we don't need that. This space is amazing. But outside this highly sanitized room is a lot of abuse yeah. that we are intimately aware of. You know, validation only takes you so far. We are demanding for accountability, and that is what the older generation can do. Step up for us, refuse to be jaded, give up that cushy seat you've sat on for so long, and do better by us, because trust me, we will leave you all behind. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to leave others behind. Mm -hmm. Trisha, follow up on that a little bit, because I'm not sure everybody in the room knows that you led a very successful cam campaign against the sanitary napkin tax in India, and got, got that passed, taken away. Um, what did you learn from that campaign that could be useful to everybody else who's watching or who's in this room? What I learned from the very beginning, the first statistic that I was introduced to is that in India, only 12% of women have access to sanitary napkins. And the rest of them are forced to use cloth, ash, sand, plastic, dried leaves. And when we tried to talk to Bollywood influencers, celebrities, no one wanted to talk about periods. We drafted a whole representation, sent it across to government ministries, asked them for multiple asks. No one cared. What I learned and what reaffirmed my faith in the power of young people is that leaders are weak. They will look in the direction of public momentum and public opinion. So we tapped into that. We did not spend a single rupee. We launched the largest campaign globally on tax-free menstrual hygiene products. We had over 24 million impressions on Twitter alone. And it was really simple. We asked influencers, comedians. That was great, because we didn't want to go to Bollywood people. All they would do is retweet or share and not add any value to it. So we reached out to people who have value. We reached out to influencers who are using their mediums, regardless of how small or big your following is, but who are you using their platform to say something that matters to others. Mm -hmm. And said, this is the issue. These are the statistics. How can you tag the finance minister, make this issue your own, and ask him to drop the tax? So we had comedians who, tweet, uh, who tweeted out to the finance minister and said, do you think I've taken a monthly subscription to Bleed? What's up? Why are you taxing me? Mm -hmm. We had another actress who said, oh, I'm uh, packing on going for my luxury vacation. Here's my luxury dress. Here's my luxury shampoo. Here's my luxury sanitary napkin. Do you think this is a damn luxury? It is not. Mm -hmm. And that just hit because what people connected with those issues and with those voices. And we made it very raw. People were putting up their own videos over from the cell phone. We didn't have film crew coming in and shooting this because we wanted people to realize these issues are real, these issues are raw, and to feel connected with it. They leaned in. And the second they leaned in and people mobilized around it, the leaders had to give in and follow suit and drop the tax. Mm. That's what I love talking to each of you backstage is sometimes it doesn't take a lot of money. It takes a lot of creativity and a lot of voice, right, in organizing people together. Uh, we just have a little bit of time. King Kaka, can you talk about how you've brought other men along on those conversations about women and girls? Yeah, so uh, same thing she has mentioned. Um, when I, when I, initially when I started, I was so excited. I was like, yeah, I'm King Kaka. I can call anyone and get them on the campaign. But then I realized down the line that I, I need believers. I don't need people who have access to, to social media. I need believers so that whenever I give you this vision, you can post it the way I, I want to post it, in, in your own language. So I said, since I started this story, 
I got criticized initially. Guys were like, man, this is a guy. Why, why, are, you, why are you fighting for the, for the girls? And, and it, it, it trended for a day, and it came, back, we came down to, there. Please, we need more men like you. Please Yeah, fight. so I, I approached a few men uh, from national team, influencers here and there, and I, I had talks with you. I, I didn't approach you because I, I had this campaign. So I, I called you and asked you, can we do lunch tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And uh, I would start stories about, uh, um, you love the weather these days. And, <laughs> uh, and how's everything back home? Uh, have you noticed that some of the guards, yeah, I've noticed it. Yeah. So if I see that you're really interested, then I'll engage you. So that, that has really been powerful with my campaign and I've seen real results. Mm. So girls are knowing by going back to school and, and, and we've created a register for them um, so that if term A, term one, they got 300 marks, we come back to you and ask you now that you're in school, why did you get 250? Mm. Yeah, so real results, real impact. Shawani, just to close out this panel, uh, give us one last thing that you'd like everyone here to remember about youth and their ability to activate other youth on these key, key sustainable goal issues. I think there is no better moment to talk about how to engage young people and young women to build 2013, to contribute to the sustainable development world. One thing that I would like to call each of you to do is to personally, but also publicly, commit to ensure that in each of your agenda, each of your intervention, young people are in the center as participant, as actor, but more that you highlight and showcase success stories because young people are not just needy, they are talent, they are innovation, they are change maker, they are the world. Mm. Well, thank you all for being here today. You've given us a lot of inspiration and a lot of ideas I think everybody here can take home with them. Yeah.